Take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. I apologize if it's a little warm in here. Somehow with all the problems, the airs didn't get dropped. Huh? What? What did I say? There's no telling. Anyway. I just know if Chris Fairchild was here, it wouldn't be hot in here. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. <clears throat> if you want to know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, here it is in these next couple of verses. And I want to preach to you today, and I want you to say this with me. I have a resurrection miracle in me. One more time. I have a resurrection miracle in me. I have a resurrection miracle in me. Jesus did not die in vain. He did not die just so we could talk about his death. He did not die to be the only man in history to be raised from the dead of his own power. Okay? He did not die and just say it's finished and gave up the ghost, the only man to ever be able to do that so we could talk about history. He died because we were spiritually dead and he came to where we were at because we could not go to where he is and so therefore we are alive in him today and the resurrection power that he had lives within us. That's Ephesians chapter 1. We'll try to read it in a minute. For I delivered unto you, 1 Corinthians 3 through 4, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul said, this was not my idea. If you can read in Acts chapter 9, you'll find out it was not Paul's idea to go into the ministry. How that Christ died for our sins. If you have a sin problem, Jesus died for that. So you're going to have to go to Him with that because He can take care of that. You'll never look good enough, smell good enough, be good enough, say good enough to deal with that on your own. You'll have to go to Jesus with that. All right? He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Once again, not just a historical thing, but according to the eternal, infallible Word of God. And that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. Jesus said, Matthew 12, I believe it is, he said, I will die and be like in the days of Noah, I will be in the uh, Jonah, in the belly of the whale, three days, three nights, and so he was there three days, three nights. <clears throat> and then he resurrected Saturday night sometime after 6 p.m. I know some of you are wondering, how did he die on Friday? Well, he didn't die on Friday, and I hate to mention that. I don't really want to upset nobody's traditional apple cart. He died actually Wednesday afternoon at 6 p.m. Because that's when Passover, he had to, because that's when Passover is. So you got, count with me, Wednesday night, <clears throat> Thursday night, Friday night. How many nights is that? Can you do math? Three, all right. Then Thursday. Friday, Saturday. How many days is that? Three. three. So that's three days. Even me and Mark can do that. That's three days and three nights, all right? And guess what? Jesus came up out of there alive and well. Today, we won't turn there, but it's in Hebrews 9 and 10. He is at the right hand of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is here with us. And so that's why we have resurrection power. Ephesians, if you want to turn there sometime and read, Ephesians 1, 16 through 21 says, Scott, that that same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is in us. Amen. Say, so, preacher, how can that be? Well, that's the mystery of salvation. Right. How can that be? Well, I'm going to give you some examples through Scripture, and I'm going to just go through them by memory. I was going to put them on the screen, but I don't have the screen. We don't have time to turn. We're a very busy society. I'm not trying to rush God, but I also know that this is a, a day that we get together as family, and we let balloons go, and we go eat, and Deborah's got food ready for me to eat. I'm already hungry. I stay hungry, all right? We're going to eat some Easter eggs. I don't know what eggs have to do with Easter. Nothing, I'm sure, but I like eggs too, all right? So give Jesus a hand clap of praise if you would, all right? <clears throat> I am at liberty to tell about the Mickey's the rebate. Right? We received, we bought Brother Mickey, our chaplain, a vehicle. And if you were here last Sunday, it was also a very, huh? 
uh, if you were here last Sunday, it's a very unique service. We're going to have this great service, and I was going to teach you this sermon and Easter sermon, some of it last week, some of it this week, but i got to cram it all into one service today. And then Jamie, God bless her, she, her, her pacemaker did something, and so we had to can the whole service, and we had to, uh, that's just a child. They make noise, all right? They make noise. Have y'all ever heard a child that didn't make noise? No, no, no. All right, so Fine. this one's still over here in the womb is making noise. If you don't believe me, go over and talk to the mom, all right? So anyway, we gave Brother Mickey a vehicle last Sunday. We surprised him. We blessed him with that. But let me tell you this. We received a phone call this week after the general manager, I'm assuming, because it had to be somebody in authority, had, the, had looked at what happened. Because we, when you go buy a vehicle for someone... Uh, Rudy, and you just pay for it, it messes with their system. You understand know what I'm saying? They're used to standing all day running credit and all that kind of stuff. And so when you go buy a vehicle and you pay for it, that just kind of jacks everything up. They don't really have a system for that, all right? <clears throat> and so that being said, and then when you buy it in somebody else's name and they're not with you, oh boy. and I'm good at making up stuff, I said, well, I can get some version of his Social Security number if that'll work. And so, uh, but they don't, they don't flow like that. So anyway, we got all that worked out. And so we got a good deal in the vehicle because we're spending God's money. We're not going to waste God's money. So we searched and prayed for what, four or six weeks probably? <clears throat> and you know my sons. They're very good at finding vehicles if you know them personally or even kind of halfway, all right? We just couldn't find it. But we found this one and I, we said, there it is. Just felt it. Well, this week, we got a good deal on it this week. Matthew received a phone call and said, we have your check, y'all's check here in the uh, desk. We have it cashed it. And if you'll, if you, if we, if we won't trouble you, if you'll come back down, we're going to take another thousand off of the vehicle and give, you know, drop it. I know some of you, okay, that means they gave us a thousand dollars off of it. I know that's kind of foreign, all right? You understand what I'm saying? Some of you like, Okay, how many of y'all had a car lot call y'all lately and say, come back, we're going to just give you $1,000? <laughs> After you done got a real good price or a bad price. Any takers? Resurrection power. You see where we're going today? Amen. God's still on the throne. He's not dead. Yes. Amen. He can do what you need done. Right. You just got to get his attention. He can do above, read Ephesians 3.20, now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can think or ask by the power that works in us. What's that power? Resurrection, Resurrection power. There you go. You can read all about it in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now, there's two things that I've noticed this pattern. I, wanna, I do want you to turn to this verse in Ecclesiastes 1.9. Ecclesiastes 1.9. I want you to turn to this verse, please. And it says, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. In other words, what's happened, God says, what's happened in God's world is going to already happen. See, God does not change. We do. Stay with me. And that which is done is that which shall be done. In other words, God functions in a pattern. He does not veer from that one degree. What he did on day one when he created the earth, he is still doing. It, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, uh, Rachel, whatever God has done, he will do. Whatever God's going to do, Price, he's already done. In principle, do you understand what I'm saying? What did God do when he saw the creation? That was his, uh, Genesis chapter 1 says God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, it says there was darkness uh, on the, uh, the, word, the earth was without form and darkness on the face of the deep. And then verse 3, God did two things. Mr. Wayne, he did two things. He spoke and he gave. Right. He did two things. Pop, he spoke and he gave. He said, let there be. Light. Now you go read the creation story, you'll find out that it was until day four that he hung the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky. So that light, Matthew, was not those two. That was the light of God. Micah, he spoke and he gave. You know how Abraham and Sarah had Isaac? They were old, past their childbearing years. 
But God spoke and said, you will have Isaac. I don't care if you are 100 years old. I don't care how old you are. And He spoke and He gave them the resurrection power within them to have birth and bring forth Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's how we have Israel today. Because Abraham, from Adam to Abraham, is 2,000 years. Okay, First 2,000 years of human history, there were no Jews. But God spoke to Abram in the Ur of Chaldees, which is uh, Iraq today, and he called him out. He changed his name, put an H in there. I'm going to call you Abraham because you're going to be the father of many nations. And so everybody in Miscarry that called him Abraham, they knew what that meant, the father of many nations, but he didn't have any kids, Candace. Here this old man's 100 years old. And they probably thought, well, that crazy old man thinks he's going to have a child. He changed his name to Abraham, the father of many nations. He can't even have one baby. You understand what I'm saying? Don't ever count God out of the picture. Why does God do stuff like that? Because so He can show Himself mighty powerful. There's a whole lot of Israel. By the way, the two biggest populations of Israel today isn't Israel. There's just as many in the United States. That's not coincidence, all right? You heard me correctly. There are just as many in the United States as are over there, all right? So that's a good thing because I want to be where they're at. I'm not over there, but praise God they're over here because they always win. <clears throat> they always win. Trust me, they will win in the end. So God speaks, Martha, and He gives. He speaks and He gives. Talk is cheap. You ever heard of saying you can't pay attention to what them folks say? Anybody here know anybody like that? Don't call their name. <coughs> You just listen to them to be polite. Miss Debbie, you towed off on yourself. You laughed a little too loud there, baby. All right? So anyway, y'all with me? Y'all still with me? Amen. Well, when God speaks, you can believe what He says, Jonathan God. Yes. And if you're participating in what God says, God will bless you. Let's just move on through the Scriptures. Just go, you can just go on through the Scriptures, and you, say this, you find this same pattern of God speaking light, and giving light, God speaking to Abraham, and we had Isaac, and God speaks, and he does things, and he just speaks, and it happens. Okay? And so he says, uh, the scripture two weeks ago that I tried to quote, and I just couldn't get it out. Luke 6, 38. It says, give, and it's not here because I hate it when I can't quote a scripture. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That means after you shook it all down, it's still running over. Shall men give to your bosom as you give, it shall be given to you. Amen. That's what Luke 6.38 says. It's part of the kingdom parables, all right? <clears throat> All right, after, I mean, it really bothered me. That was two weeks ago, I'm pretty sure over there. I couldn't quote, quote that verse of Scripture. It really messed with my head. I'm just telling you the truth. Because see, when I first started to preach, I didn't know what to say. I know you think as much as you talk, well, talking out there and talking in here, two different things. Okay? You can talk some junk out there. I'm a professional at that. You don't talk junk in here. Especially not up here. So I didn't know what, Rudy, I didn't know what to say, so I just memorized scriptures. God gave me a good memory, so I just memorized scriptures. So I've never had no problem quoting whole chapters. But then, Doc, that messed me up bad. It, it messed me up bad. I mean, I went home, sat on the side of my bed, and wept like a baby. Until I got a text. The text was, well, you've still got it. I thought to myself, I don't know what they're talking about, but I hope they continue texting me here. I got something, praise God. I've lost my mind, but maybe they found it for me. Amen. <clears throat> I said, what do you mean? This particular family was praying about giving a very sacrificial offering to this church, which actually made it possible for us to buy Brother Mickey that truck. <clears throat> And they gave it that Sunday that I couldn't quote that verse of Scripture. Because it, once it's here, 
I'd advise you not to take it back. Just throw that in there, will you, okay? <clears throat> if you have to drink water out of the creek, if you put it in this offering plate, I'd advise you to leave it there. Just, just tip. It ain't going to change my life one bit, but it's going to have a tremendous effect on yours, all right? So anyway, that being said, because hell in every kind of way come against this family, after they drop that in that offering plate, Scotty, I mean, it got the heat turned up. And that gave them confirmation. When I couldn't quote that verse of Scripture, they knew it wasn't just them, Martha. They said, man, this is whoo. And when I, when I found out what they had done, Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, if you want it resurrected, you're going to have to speak and you're going to have to give. Amen. Now, I tithe. My giving records are no secret. Martha has the liberty to show them to you anytime. Whether you go to this church or you don't, don't make me any difference. But I'm talking about above. You see, when David was, was appointed king, when he was appointed king, uh, when Joshua had moved into Canaan land, this Mount Zion, Joshua never took that, Mitzi, because of the Jebusites that lived up there. They were evil people. And so Joshua and them stopped at the bottom of Mount Zion, what we refer to as Mount Zion. They stopped because Joshua and them, they just what? They was afraid. They would, Joshua, they would not go. Joshua would not go up there, Joshua. He said, them boys are some bad boys. That's a bunch of boatners from Plattsburgh, okay? And so we just go, if they'll leave us alone, we'll just leave them alone. And Joshua wasn't no sissy boy. He fought 14 and a half years of some bad folks. So them Jebusites, Hilton, were some bad boys. See, some people don't want to be whooped. I know some bullies that uh, bully people when I was in high school, but they, some folks don't want to be bullied. I won't go into it, but I know several bullies that are 38 right here. Just stopped them because they was beating on somebody that couldn't whoop them. But, hey, you better watch all their hands and feet and teeth because everybody don't fight fair, all right? Well, it's not fair to beat them up. Either. Yeah, okay. And the bullies at the graveyard, and they still walking around. <laughs> So David, first thing when he got king, he said, we're going to take Mount Zion. You know what? Alex, everybody said, you can't do that. <clears throat> that was just like pouring gas on David's fire. He said, you can't do it. His nephew Joab said, David said, whoever goes up there with me, whoever gets to the top with me, I'm going to make him the captain of my guard. David's nephew, Joab, who was a killer because he was just like his uncle David, the sight of blood did not bother them. They were warriors. And Joab was a little different spirited than David. And so Joab said, I'll go. And they went and they took it. They got to the top. They left one alive. And David was actually going to, David was going to, uh, and he, he made this deal. He said, David, I'm going to give you this land to put the tabernacle up here. And David said, no, sir. I'm not going to take a gift and then me turn around and give it. I, I want it to cost me something. And he wrote the man a check for something he was going to give him, Mr. Tate. Because I'm going to put the house of God here and I want it to cost me something. Now, I have an amount of money written on this envelope right here that I'm going to put in this offering because I'm not going to do something I don't ask you to do. Ever. Ever. There is no way for you to know this amount <clears throat> or how important it is to me and my family. But it won't fix some problems I got. I need my health fixed. Yeah. My wife's health fixed. I don't care how much money you got. Some things money won't fix. Last Sunday when Jamie had that situation. No matter how much money, we could have just dumped piles of money on her would not have fixed it. But we prayed and God touched her and they're going to fix it this coming Tuesday. Yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? That could have went a whole other way. I'm going to tell you what was happening behind the scenes. We was giving Jamie's uncle, Chaplain Mickey, a blessing and Satan come in here and tried to jack up her batteries and stuff. And so we had to just shut it down. So there's a spirit world that you don't see until it's manifested into the natural world. 
And so I'm telling you there's a resurrection miracle in you. Yes. Not condemning you. Not trying to make you feel bad if you don't feel led to give in this offering. That's between you and God. Has not one. Don't you, if God don't speak to you, hey, if God don't speak to you, be no offense here. But this house, this, this place here has touched many, many peoples. The sermons here have been watched in over 100 countries. There's a whole movement of God taking place on the other side of the world right now because of you. Because of God. There are people here say, Brother Scotty, why do you mention that? Well, they're 10,000 miles away. Every how many miles is Everybody always says 10,000, but I've never really measured it. I don't know how far it is over there. I know it's a long way on a plane. So, but anyway, that being said, I don't talk about a lot of stuff we do. Here, publicly, don't want to embarrass people. <clears throat> I don't want to make people feel bad. Folks is broke, can't pay the light bill. You go pay the light bill, then put it on Facebook. Whatever. What kind of ignorance is that? Can I get an amen? amen? Every month we send money to St. Jude's. Every month. This place right here sends money to the Crisis Pregnancy Center. Every month we buy Bibles with the Gideons. And I can go on. There's several, I can't even, we have one retired preacher that we send money to every month. This is a giving church. Amen. It's God's house. So God spoke to me two weeks ago when all that happened. We couldn't quote that verse of scripture. And so he spoke to me and said, this is what I want you to do. I swallowed real deep. <clears throat> I don't have no money in my bank account. But I do have a little folded money, or I did have a little folded money. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to just fold this right here. Some of y'all don't know what folded money is, all right? Some of y'all don't know what folded money is. I see a few of you that knows what folded money is. I see a few of you that knows what it is, but you ain't got none either, all right? So, <laughs> can I get an amen? amen? But you know somebody that's got some folded money. That's why you know about folded money. Can I get an amen? Yeah. There you go. But the funny thing about money is God don't need any of it. Yeah. <laughs> he don't need a dime. He don't need a, yeah. he don't need a dime. He pays roads with gold. Builds doors out of pearls. Right? So he don't need no money. But I need to give him something. Amen. I want to participate in what he's got going because when everything else, when the stars fall from the sky, baby, God's house will still be so this is that church that told me 16 years ago when I took it, went up town to a business to transact, and he said, are you Tuck West Philadelphia? I said, yeah. He said, you do know you need to go down and pull the meter, this is a quote, and let the grass grow up, right? Whatever. The only place grass is growing is at his business now. Uh -oh. True story. Not being ugly, I'm just telling you. It closed. Uh -oh. I would not count God out. Amen. See, I really actually do believe the Word of God. See, my mama taught me. She said, son, when you give, give you tithes, but if you ain't got but $10, you made $100, you give you 10% tithes, you always want to give another dollar. Don't just give. I mean, he, she said, you can't out. You want to see my mama, there's three things she's going to do to you, whether you needed them or not. She's going to feed you. She's going to doctor on you. She's going to give you some kind of herbs or something or another to help your headache. And then she's going to give you something. She lived back here in her happy room. I thought she's crazy. I've decided now I was the one crazy. She had a little happy room back in the back of the house where folks would give her little whatnots all over the years. Boys, y'all remember, all, I mean, just all kind of just for me. Hey, Lord, forgive me, but just a bunch of junk really looked like to me. But anyway, teddy bears and all kind of stuff. And she sat back here in her happy room with a pair of big headphones. Watching She Wrote Murder. Watching She Wrote Murder. That's her translation for Murder She Wrote. Is that the name of it? Really? Okay. Well, the 30... Uh, was it a 38 or 357? 357, yeah. She had she wrote murder on, sitting back here in her half room in a recliner, and she could see up the hallway of that trailer house and the doors right here, and she had that 357 revolver laying in her lap. <clears throat> when you went in, you went in. Am I telling the truth? Am I telling the truth? When you went in, you could hear she wrote murder outside. You follow what I'm saying? <laughs> when you went in, you better flag like this. No. It's me. No. Don't shoot. I'm telling the gospel truth. See, I don't have to make stuff up, baby. 
I don't have to make nothing up about my some stuff. See, I just only I have to think before I tell some stories. That's why I stop sometimes. I can't tell that one. And my daddy's sitting over in the chair. He never even gets up. He says, son, she'll shoot you. You better wave. I'm like, Daddy, won't you know, won't you like do something? Get a flag and wave or dear God, do something, Levon. But she gonna feed you and she gonna give you some little happy. Am I telling the truth? She's baby, come here, baby. It doesn't matter if you liked it or not. That's not a factor, okay? Baby, come here and get you. You see that right there? Get that and take that with you. Get you a Debbie cake. Yeah, get you. Are you hungry, baby? Vaughn, get these children some Debbie cakes. <laughs> now, she couldn't hear, Pop. She couldn't hear, but she could smell you open a bag of Tom's barbecue tater chips a country mile. <laughs> and she knew when that refrigerator door opened, too. Yeah, what y'all eating in there? I know y'all eating something. Say, God bless my mom and dad. Amen. Now, I didn't just tell all that aimlessly. See, I remember when we didn't have nothing but potato soup and cornbread. Right. Deb remembers that little house we lived in didn't have no bathroom and no telephone. So I'm just 57 years old in that pink room. I mean, I'm trying to remember that pink room. Deb was saying something. We're, best place ever. Best place ever. Didn't have no indoor toilet, didn't have no telephone. Say, Brother Scott, are you too young for that, baby? You ain't been to Plattsburgh, have you? <laughs> But it was a happy place. I didn't know no better. Happy place for Debbie, my first cousin, and Debbie, my first cousin on my boat on her side. They come and they'd stay, and it made both of them fight. And they still mad because I was born, messed up the whole plan. You understand what I'm saying? But they love me anyway. <laughs> but when my mama died. She wasn't living in that place with no bathroom. Sweetheart. They were givers. They certainly were. Yes. When they had nothing. Oh, yeah. It didn't just, just start. I've seen my mama go to the bank and borrow money and buy coats for kids. That was cold. She always gave Every day wasn't a good day. Amen. Did you hear me, honey? She always gave most of her lunch away. Yeah. Every day at school. You can't outgive God. But I do know you can give enough to get his attention. Because yeah. I have before. One time God told me to give all my money away. It was a total of $535. That was it. That was it. What none of that? You know how people tell you I'm broke and they got $10,000 on some CD? I don't even know what that is. It's something you play, I reckon. I don't know if it's supposed to be money, but I ain't got one, all right? So uh, if I got one, it's hot to somebody, but God's going to deliver me, all right? <clears throat> you know, some folks tell you that, but they really got... When I say I'm broke, Wayne Beckham... That means a change, too. Huh? That means you roll change. <laughs> when I say I'm broke... Grant, when I say I'm broke, baby, that's the truth. I ain't got no better sense but to tell it. I'm 600 miles away from here. Most of you know the story. And God told me to give all my money away. So did you have all your money with you? Well, of course. My God, I had $535, most money I ever had in my life. God told me, he said, give all your money away. I said, well, God, you have to talk to my wife. It's going to have to be a family affair if we're sitting on the side of the road hungry. With two babies. With two babies. Lord God, I looked over there, Scotty, and she's sitting there where squalling. I said, my God, I'm going to have to give all my money away. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with you? She said, I'm digging my pennies out of the purse because God said give all her money away. I was 600 miles from home. I didn't have no credit cards. Didn't have nobody to ask. And I was a speaker at this meeting, and they done gave me my love offering. So there wasn't no money coming in. You understand what I'm saying? We gave him my love offering away, too. And so I didn't know nobody there. I was a guest there, first time ever there, long story short. I said, now God, <coughs> and I didn't get up and announce and cry and tell about my mama and all that mama and them stories. I very quietly, Mickey, went up, put every dime I had in that offering plate. I went back and said, Oop. I didn't take my wallet and dump it so somebody would feel sorry for me. And I didn't know anybody there. I said, now, God, you're going to have to help me trust you. 
Never forget what he said. Mark, he said, you can trust me. He said, I just need to know if I can trust you. I'm never better than I. I'd rather be on the side of the road hungry in the will of God if a mile of five hundred thirty-five dollars. Before I left that day, people that didn't even know me come up to me and said, now, I know you probably don't need this, but ain't you that preacher that preached the other day? I said, yeah. They said, well, here. Now, I specifically remember that day, Bubba, that my gas on my Toyota Camry with the light was on. It doesn't been on like women drive two or three days. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and the man who went on the service station come up and said, now, I don't want to trouble you, preacher, but I really enjoyed your preaching, and I own a gas station downtown. Before you leave going home, you come by, I want to fill you up, get it on empty. I said, I tell you what, since we're close, we'll just go on down there now. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I was praying I could make it down there following him because I didn't want to have to use my money that folks had just walked up to me and gave me to stop and get some gas to get to the free gas. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> I know it. This is not a story. I don't read this in no book, baby. I don't have to read no story book. I was there. Matthew was there. <laughs> Michael was there. He don't remember probably, but he was there. <sighs> so, Brother Scott, you not worried about giving all that money away? No, it's just money. God's got plenty of it. your attention please Woo! Woo! Hello. hello there you go we do this every year uh, it's kind of a fun thing and Jesus rose from the grave we found a balloon years ago in a field in Georgia long story that where a church had done this we got the idea oh, a long time ago anyway so we've been doing it ever since, and uh, I think the furthest away we received an email was North Carolina a couple years ago. And so, uh, hey, it's fun, and it gives something for the kids to look forward to, and it's a happy day because Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive and well. These are all biodegradable. These are biodegradable. Yeah. So we're environmentally friendly. I didn't even know it. Praise God, the first thing I've ever done, environmentally friendly, all right? So uh, are y'all ready? Three, two, one, go. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, well, it don't matter.